Welcome into the KSO Show. I'm Mason Voth. Here in the middle of the week as the Wildcats get ready for the final quarter of their season. Three games remain for K-State. Baylor at home this weekend. Next week, the big road matchup at KU. And then the finale at home, Farmageddon with Iowa State. And still a lot for the Wildcats to play for despite the loss to Texas that makes their chances at returning the Big 12 title game very, very slim. They are going to need some serious help and a bunch of math equations that are far too complicated for me to spend any time figuring out right now to tell you what needs to happen. So uh, the best thing K-State can do is keep winning and hope that other things happen along the way. And even if you just continue to win, if you're K-State, you have four more games left on the schedule, three regular season, one bowl game. You win all four. It's another 10-win season for the Wildcats. That is an important thing for them and a lot of other things to set them up for future success as well. Well, K-State got to have their Tuesday press conferences this week and a lot of the topics there. Nothing too earth-shattering coming out of it. I mean, sometimes you get press conferences that are filled with a lot of great nuggets and Chris Kleiman gives out some very valuable stuff and a lot of easy things to kind of talk about um, that people are really interested in. It was pretty ho-hum this week, though. I think You can get that sometimes after a loss, especially like one with Texas where they battled. And really, everything that happened in that game was kind of erased, and the focus just came down to one or two big moments in it. And we are certainly going to talk about those because those are the fascinating parts of that game. But I think that uh, there were some other things from Tuesday that stood out to me and that that came from Will Howard, and I think that they are a a fascinating thing to kind of dissect and look at. So uh, we will have clips from those guys and kind of go over everything but we'll start with Chris Kleiman the leading man for the Wildcats and the way everything has kind of played out for him he was asked about it after the game and there is still a lot of conversation going around like okay what was the decision making process how did this go down why'd you go for two or why'd you go for the touchdown not settle for the field goal go to double overtime I explained it after the game on the Sunday show again on Monday I'm cool with the decision that Chris Kleiman made. I I think he made the 100% right call in that moment. I am I am totally down for it. And he explained when the decision was made and also how the thought process was even if Texas had scored a touchdown. So here's what Chris Kleiman said about the aggressiveness and going for the win in Austin. It was talked about when we went to overtime that we were going to have a chance we were going to win the game. We We didn't have a lot left in the tank, honestly with the amount of guys that we uh, had playing as many snaps. Uh, I didn't know if we'd stop them. I thought we had a chance, but if if we didn't stop them and they scored and kicked the PAT, we were going to match that, score a touchdown, and go for two and try to win. On the flip side, once we got the stop, they they made the field goal. Um, if it were anything, probably fourth and five or, or, or less, we were going to go for it. If it was fourth and eight, we probably would have kicked the field goal just because that's a little bit harder. But this is one yard outside of a, outside of a, a two-point conversion. And um, we went there to win. We went there to win the game. And um, I don't know. We also had some struggles. You know, we, we had um, a miscommunication on a snap, and we had a, a missed field goal. And I just didn't want I'm, – I'm confident we would have – been able to do those things and, and execute it. But if we didn't, I didn't want to go in that locker room after and miss two short field goals and say, we didn't put it on a bunch of fifth, sixth year seniors up front and a uh, fifth year quarterback that um, was really had a hot hand. All right. So there you go. That That's, that's basically what I thought in the moment. You already had two failed short kicks during the day. You kick yourself if you had put – the, the special teams group in that position again, and for some reason they didn't come through, and you'd feel like an idiot, and I think that contributed to it. And also just, uh, I mean, he said they were gassed. You, you got to go for the win in that situation, and he didn't dive into it, but and maybe he wasn't thinking it. There were so many other things that he addressed that he thought uh, going for it and going for the win in the first overtime was the right call. He'd probably even think like I was, where I don't think K-State's built, at least not against Texas, for the new – uh, overtime shootout crap that goes on after you get to the third overtime when you start trading two-point conversions there. So I think that he made the right call. One of the fascinating things inside of that, though, is talking about we decided we were going to put it on um, so, some guys and our you know fifth and sixth-year seniors to go out and get the job done and let them get us the win. 
Very fascinating considering that those fifth and sixth year guys, some of them up front, did not come through for you in that moment. And Chris Kleiman also not directly talking about them, but spoke of another moment in that game where they did not happen to come through. And uh, that was the third and short play that K-State ran the draw with Will Howard. They ended up getting stuffed. And he addressed why K-State decided not to go for the kill and the win in that moment and why they settled for the field goal that Chris Tennant ultimately missed. We were going to go for it had we had a fourth and one. It was third and one, and we lost two yards. And we got crushed at the line of scrimmage on that play. And um, I was like, shoot, let's just tie the game. And credit to our players, credit to our guys, because they bailed me out, they bailed Chris out in the fact of, we lose a couple yards. Yep, I thought about it. Nope, let's tie the game. Let, let's We've battled our tail off. Let's tie the game. Probably why I didn't do it the next time. But the fact that we went from third and one to fourth and three, we kicked the field goal and miss it. We got our three timeouts left, and our defense goes out there and stuffs them. And they know we're gonna what our defense is in. They know exactly what we're going to be in, and we know probably what plays they're going to run, and we stop them. Use our timeouts get the ball kicked, and I would tell you, Colin Klein thought we were going to score a touchdown. And we had a couple really good plays to at least get us a shot. And I was pretty confident. Um, honestly, Chris wasn't going to miss that kick with whatever seconds left. And it was, what was it, a 45-yarder or something? And he banged that thing. And um, that's I was so proud of us getting back to that moment. And that's why once we got to overtime, um, we were going to find a way to give ourselves a chance to win it. So, kind of interesting there. And, and this was one of the thoughts that I had in the immediate aftermath was, if you were going to go for the win in overtime, why were you not going for the win in regulation in that moment? I mean, it just seems like something that would have made more sense to do, that if you were going to be that aggressive and you were that adamant about it in the overtime period, why was it not that way earlier in the fourth quarter? Well, Chris Kleiman explained it there, and that was kind of what I was looking for. It didn't really, it didn't fully satisfy me though, because I would have been interested to know, okay, why was the decision to not be aggressive with that third down play? Obviously, it's because Chris Kleiman, Colin Klein, put some faith in experienced offensive linemen that, quite frankly, have not come through for K State this year in a lot of ways. Chris Kleiman talked about how they were good in pass protection against Texas. I think that's true for the most part. It would check out. I mean, obviously, Cooper Beebe was just his dominant self in that department. But other guys on this offensive line have struggled a lot this season. And I, I think that if people have paid attention over the last year, now I guess going on two years, last season and this season, you'd be able to tell that, okay, obviously, Cooper Beebe is that guy. He is an impressive player for the Wildcats. He knows what he's doing. And he he is, I mean, he is he is a dominant force up there. A lot of the other offensive line talk, at least the way I see it, and the the cachet that they get, it's it's coming off of Cooper Beebe's success. And I think sometimes one really good offensive lineman or a couple in K State's case, because KT Loveston uh is is typically a pretty solid offensive lineman for them. I think that that gets generated and pushed around to everybody. And it's now it's just a unit thing. Well. That's not really the case. I mean, we know that Hayden Gillum and Hadley Panzer had not very good days. They got blown up. It's what killed the one play that was supposed to go to DJ Giddens in overtime um, when when they couldn't hold a block and Hadley Panzer's guy was able to get up and swat the pass down from Will Howard. The opportunity was there. The offensive line just didn't do their job. And there were other examples of it in the, the game, including that third and short play where K-State was trying to get it, and if they failed but still had fourth and one, Chris Kleiman says they would have gone for it again. And for the offensive line to not come through, that's a massive failure on their part in that situation. But I will also put some of this on Chris Kleiman, Colin Klein, whoever had a hand in this decision-making process for K-State, because that offensive line had been getting torched all game. There's a reason why K-State didn't have very many rushing yards. And you knew you had that information by the fourth quarter that you could not run the ball with success. So it was confusing to me that that would be the play that you went with there and to rely on guys that had not come through in that game. I think that's a really uh, uh, the only thing that I would have to question there. The bigger takeaway, though, and Chris Kleiman is not directly saying this. He's, I don't even think he was trying to say this, but it comes across this way 
because when 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 you only have a couple of options on how to explain something and it's going to come through pretty clear that even if you try to dance around something that's right there in front of you you're going to have to address it even if you do it in an indirect way i think he was doing that with the offensive line they did not come through and that's that's basically the gist of what i got out of that is that offensive line didn't come through it cost k-state an opportunity to be aggressive and go for the win in the fourth quarter and then obviously it cost them a chance for the win in overtime because two of the plays just never had a shot because the offensive line didn't do their job on on second and fourth down. So that to me is is one of the bigger takeaways from the game at Texas. I mean, there are a lot of things that can be discussed on why K-State didn't have a chance to win that game. The offensive line is the number one reason why K-State did not beat Texas. And this is this is not a this, I'm not a grader where a group project Everybody's going to get the same grade. Certain guys on that offensive line, they they get their their well earned positive grade from me. Most of them do not get that, and everybody that has either listened to me for the last however many years talk about K State football or has their own set of eyes and a, a functioning brain that works for themselves, you know exactly who let K State down on Saturday. And I think. I look, I think some guys on on this offensive line don't necessarily live up to the hype. I don't think that they are always as bad as they were against Texas. I don't think K-State will have an offensive line game as bad as what they had against Texas. That is just a different beast. That is that is the toughest defense K-State will face all season in a lot of areas, including up front. It's a tough matchup for them. And K-State's offensive line will not be that bad again. But you got to call a spade a spade. And the offensive line is the number one reason why K-State lost that game on Saturday. And it reared its ugly head in two of the biggest moments in which K-State was going to be aggressive and try and win the football game. And honestly, they weren't afforded fair shots at it. That being Will Howard and the receivers that were having a great game and the defense that worked their butt off to keep K-State in, in the game. They did not have a fair shot because of what happened in front of them. And Chris Kleiman, again, not trying to directly say that he's not throwing anybody under the bus. But when something is so obvious, it becomes unavoidable to talk about and address. And his answers gave me kind of what I expected, what I needed to know. Um, and I think in the future, in these situations, if you're Chris Kleiman and and then Colin Klein, the play caller, you have to be you have to be more aware of that. And don't have such blind faith in guys that have experience or guys that you think can handle the moment. If they have proven to you in that game that they cannot handle that moment. You need to be more aggressive yourselves. Take it out of their hands. And that's why K-State probably should have put the ball in the air on third down. I understand the logic. It's totally fine. If you if you think you have two plays from one yard, run it on third down. Give yourself a, a chance to get a cheapie, not have a dangerous play there. Unfortunately for K-State, the guys that were supposed to come through on that play, they just hadn't been all game. They didn't in that moment, and they didn't later on when K-State needed them most. So that is that. I'm sure some people will not be happy about that because obviously there's a faction of people that don't like anything negative being said at all about certain guys. And then there are other people that just, you know, they, they think that, you know, some, some spots are immune to criticism. Uh, the offensive line deserves to be heavily criticized for how things played out uh, in, in the game against Texas. Moving on, though, one guy that does not deserve a ton of criticism for what happened in Austin is Will Howard. Will Howard has gotten a ton of stuff piled on him at various points in K-State football history in his four years that he's been at, at K-State now. And full transparency, I was right there with most of you that were trashing Will Howard through the first two years of his career at K-State. He gave us no reason to think that what was going to happen in 2022 was going to happen in 2022. But he came through. He did. I was high on Will Howard coming into the season. And things got a little shaky there. And I've explained my stance on this multiple times that, look, I have always said K-State's peak this year, their highest point in the ceiling, that will come with Will Howard at quarterback. I was just skeptical on if he was going to be able to get it back and regain that form that we saw last season that we expected from him. Because he put, to, he put together two tough performances at Oklahoma State and Texas Tech. I mean, probably two of the, the worst outings of his career given – how he has the experience and he has the talent and all everything else that goes with it now. But he's bounced back over the last three games. Nine touchdowns, only one pick, and the one pick bounced off Keegan Johnson's chest. It was not Will Howard's fault. 
He's been playing phenomenally. He threw for a career high in passing yards, and he is now just three touchdown passes away from being the career passing leader at K-State in terms of touchdowns. And look, I know that the passing records are weak at K-State, but there have been some really good quarterbacks that have not been able to get to that. Now, obviously, a guy like Michael Bishop, he only was here for two seasons, so that impacts that in some way. Sorry to John Kurtz, Jake Waters was only here for two seasons, and he was a great passer. But there have been guys that have had that opportunity. They haven't done it. Will Howard is knocking on the doorstep of that. He's also six away from tying the single season record, which something before the beginning of the season. To everybody that thinks that I am the Will Howard hater that Ben Sennett was talking about, I said before the season started that I thought Will Howard broke the passing touchdown record for a single season at K-State. I still believe that happens this year. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that Ben Sennett was not talking about me, but maybe he was. Will Howard, I asked him about it at the press conferences on Tuesday, and uh, he kind of gave his answer on what it means to him and, and a little bit more as he was, as most players are, modest about the individual records. Uh, but gave some good insight as to to what it would mean for his resiliency. Yeah, that's that's cool. I, I try not to think about that. I'm gonna do um, do what I can to get the wins, and you know, if that comes, that'd be that would be a tremendous honor, and I'd be forever grateful to to hold that um, hold that record. And um, you know, I, I hope somebody somebody else comes and breaks it because that would mean that the Cats are winning games. But to be in that position, given all the ups and downs with your career, I mean. What does that mean to you for your resiliency and everything that you've been able to make out of it? Um, it, it means it means a lot because um, <laughs> you know it's not been easy, and uh, you know to think that through all that stuff that I've had to kind of go through, um, that that has still happened, and I've still had that. You know, it kind of reminds me of the um, you know the success that I've had, although it's not always been perfect. Um, and you no, know, it's cool. It, it's a it's a credit to the guys around me. It's a credit to the the coaches for putting me in good situations. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm blessed. I think one of the most telling things that he says in there is hoping that somebody comes along and and breaks that record. Then in the future, if he is to have it, because it means that the cats are having success. I think that shows a lot about who Will Howard is, what he thinks about K State, and what we assumed and talked about when the conversations about is should it be Will Howard, should it be Avery Johnson were going on, that, look, he, he's frustrated and he hates the situation for himself. He wants to play better. He wants to be better. But he's not going to take it out on whatever needs to happen for the team. And ultimately, what needs to happen for the team is Will Howard to be the quarterback right now. That's become apparent for them over the last couple of weeks by the way that he has played. But he is, he is the right there. He has the opportunity to break that record. now. The question would be is, okay, if something wild happens and for some reason he doesn't throw three more touchdown passes this year, uh, he would have the opportunity to come back and play in 2024. But kind of unprovoked talking about just, you know, why what it took for K-State to come back, how how tough is it to, to when you're in that situation down that big to keep fighting and, and get back into it. He gave a good answer to it, but then started talking about more of the other things with it and – I got kind of the sense that 2023 is going to be Will Howard's last year at at K-State. It just kind of has that feel to it where he's going to have put in his four years. He doesn't need that COVID year. Obviously, he's playing better now to where uh, I think that given his size and some of the skill set he has, I mean, if you're a quarterback with a heartbeat uh, that's draft eligible, you get drafted most of the time. We've seen that in past years. Will Howard has more of the size and and kind of just things that guys are looking for at the NFL level. I think that's back on the table for him after this year. So I thought he gave some pretty good hints about what his decision might be after the season. And in my opinion, it looks like he might forego that COVID year, which uh, we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit on if it's good or bad for K-State. We're going to keep fighting. And regardless of what the, what the outcome could be or should be or what, what it, might be we're not worried about that we're worried about creating our legacy and and controlling what we can for the next three weeks and and enjoying it because we only have so much time left together as this team and you know we only have two more shots at the bill so um it's almost surreal you know to to think that the season's gone by this fast you know it's it's sad in a way but it's also 
um, you know, it's, it's rewarding because, you know, how much this team is, has worked and, and put into everything. Um, you know, we're going to have fun and we're going to take advantage of every opportunity we can get together because, um, you know, speaking for myself, man, this team means the world to me. And I couldn't be more grateful for this place for turning me into the, the person that I am. And, and um, you know, I have, we have, as this, as this 2023 team, we have, um, you know, only so many shots left. So we're going to, we're going to not, not let any moment pass us by and, and, and have fun with it and take advantage of it. So obviously a lot of that, he, he does say, Hey, this 2023 team, but it felt like one of those deals where it's trying to add on after you say something and you're trying to, you know, cover up maybe a couple of things. Uh, I, obviously I don't think that he's fully made that decision yet. I think that we would probably have a better idea if that were the case, but just based on his words, his, his actions, his mannerisms, everything there, it seems to me that, that Will Howard is, as long as this season finishes the way he wants it to, it's going to look back, realize that through all the ups and downs, he had an awesome career at K state. People will remember him fondly. Obviously that happens when you're the big 12 champion quarterback, at K-State, and I think that, you know, he could say four years is enough. I, I did everything that I need to do. My opportunity will be there, and uh, he'll be comfortable moving on from K-State. And also, again, like Avery Johnson will be a sophomore next season. That is an all-time talent that K-State has on their roster. They are going to want to use him, and in all likelihood, it, Will Howard probably wants to make that conversation not have to happen between like him and Chris Kleiman and Colin Klein and just, you know, have this honest talk about what the future and the direction of K-State football is. And, you know, in no ways is that me trying to, you know, push Will Howard out for them. But I think it's something to just kind of take into, in, into consideration. And I do think that uh, Will Howard understands the situation at hand. And he also probably has a lot of different feelings about how his career has played out. And he understands that, hey, I might be at a, a time in my career where this is a, a good stopping point. I've done everything I needed to do. I was here for the full term and tenure of what a college career typically is um, without you know the craziness of COVID that went on. So we'll have to see and wait for the final answer on that, obviously, after the season ends. But I think we kind of got our hint and our idea at what the future of K-State football is next season. And it's probably that Will Howard won't be here, which makes it easier on K-State. You give the keys to Avery Johnson for two or three seasons and hope you make the most of it. Now, for that being good or bad for K-State, I do think it's a good thing. I think if you can get everything to kind of end the way it was supposed to before the season, which was Will Howard goes out, has a strong senior season. K-State goes out, has a good season as a team, which is still very possible. Again, they win their Final Four. They finish 10-3. and three. That's a really good season. And I think that's good. Everything is fine there. Move on. And Avery Johnson's ready to come in and play and lead and, and be the guy next season. So I think that's where things stand. I think we got a pretty good hint at that. And uh, I think everybody will probably embrace Will Howard over the, the rest of the season. I know things got nasty there again for a little bit. I think most people have come back around, though. And I think that obviously we talked about it after the game, but the Ben Sinek comments are, uh, that's a guy just sticking up for, for his dude and Will Howard. And I'm sure he, he's just as sick of hearing people doubt Will Howard when he knows what Will Howard can do and what he did last season. And also these guys, even though they, they don't outwardly say it to defend themselves or, or their teammates, they know the situation just like the rest of us. And if, and if we could, could have all been honest at times that, the offensive line was not playing great at times. Some guys just don't pull their weight up front. And the receiving situation has been pretty disgusting for most of the season for K-State. You only had a couple of guys from time to time that would step up. Now we're starting to see all that be put together where, hey, it's not just your really talented tight end and Ben Sennett, who, by the way, he is probably going to head off to the NFL after this season. He got a senior bowl invite uh, today. And then also, I mean, thinking about, just the, the career that's there. Those two guys are, are that close, so he and Will Howard could probably walk out of here together, uh, and it would make a lot of sense. But those guys know that 
Will Howard had some some tough things in front of him as a quarterback. You got to wear that. Like you're the guy with the ball on every play. You're going to get the the praise for success, and you're going to get the 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 blame for failure. It's just how the position works. But it it is truly a team game, and K State had guys not helping out on the team at different points this season. Now it feels like the offense is in a really good spot. I know that the running game is coming off their worst game of the season. I'm not worried about them at all. I think that's just the product of playing Texas. The offensive line has, even as much as it seems like I've been so down and negative on them today, uh, I think they had their worst game of the year. I don't think they're going to play that bad again, and you're not going to face a defense like Texas. Is. So I think the offense is ready to go. I think we are going to see the best version of the K-State offense over the last two seasons, these last four games. And I get look, that means even a team that won a Big 12 title last year and had Deuce Vaughn on it. I think that this team is in a good spot right now with their balance and everything else that plays out. We'll just have to see if they actually prove me right in their game against Baylor, Kansas, Iowa State, and then the bowl game. So that is what it looks like for everything else. D.Y. and I will be back on Friday for the game preview as K-State gets ready to take on Baylor. We'll also talk a little bit of hoops as K-State returns home. Has the home opener with Bellarmine on Friday night. Going to be an awesome weekend in Manhattan if you're going to be able to get to both or one of each. Uh, that's going to be a fun time to Friday night in Bramlage and then Saturday afternoon inside Bill Snyder Family Stadium. Make sure you're staying locked in with everything going on over at On3. National Signing Day in basketball was today. David Castillo is locked in with the Cats, the four-star guard from Oklahoma who is getting ready to play his final season of high school basketball right here in Wichita at Sunrise Christian for, I guess, for however many Bel Air residents are listening, I'll just, I'll, I'll be politically correct and say here in, in Bel Air, uh, just so nobody gets offended and you get your shout out that you deserve, but that's all going on. So read up on the David Castillo signing at KSO over on on three. And then obviously loads of football coverage going on right now. And then plenty as we lead up to the basketball game on Friday. So, that will do it for me, Mason Voth. Stay locked in with K-State Online. Thank you for watching and listening wherever you may be.